speakers will lead us into this. May I first introduce then uh, the Reverend Dr. Mike Ovi, who is the principal of Oak Hill Theological College in London. Uh, and he is speaking uh, about grace, uh, the grace of God, uh, both in the church, uh, but also uh, how the world uh, resists God's grace and uh, in its place, in place of true grace, actually proposes a false and a cheap grace. So please welcome Dr. Michael Ovi. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Michael, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to, to speak here. Let me just uh, try and get that a little better. Uh, I've entitled this uh, talk, The Grace of God or the World of the West. Let's pray. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. My first really significant encounter with worldwide Anglicanism came when I was at Theological College. It was 1990, and an East African uh, 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 vicar was on secondment with us, and he was invited to preach in the college chapel. He posed a question. Which gospel, he asked, which gospel do you expect us to believe? The one that you originally came to us with, or the one that you're talking about now? Which gospel? I was horrified. Not because it was offensive, but because it was true. My East African brother's question has nagged away at me ever since, uh, and I've been asking myself how it is uh, that we now have a different gospel in the West from the one that we once had and once preached. I think the difference is nothing less than the grace of God and what we mean by it. The difference comes from the way that Western culture and the Western church denies or distorts God's grace. The modern West, in both church and culture, is overall, I'm afraid, graceless, and it has become so because of its worldliness. That is why I've called this, uh, this talk, The Grace of God or The World of the West. Ultimately, you cannot have both. It is either or. My prayer is that we as global Anglicans will actually realize this and choose grace rather than the world of the West. My fear is that increasingly, more and more of us will choose the world of the West and that God will judge us for it. But I must now explain why I think it is that grace is at stake and then why the culture of the West actually denies grace and how the Western church distorts it. So let me begin with grace. And on first hearing, you may simply think that I am crazy. People in the Western church, if you listen to them, talk an awful lot about grace. If anything, the charge is that traditional believers like me lack grace. So what am I getting at? It's this. It is not enough just to say the word grace an awful lot. The issue is what we mean by it and whether we mean what the Bible means by it or whether we have made up our own meanings for ourselves. Now the kind of grace that I think the Western church talks about and come to that Western culture talks about when it thinks of the matter is this, cheap grace. Cheap grace. I'm borrowing from the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he says this, cheap grace is the grace that we bestow on ourselves. Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. And as we listen to Bonhoeffer's description, we must note three points. This grace is worldly, worldly. Bonhoeffer means that it is no different from the world and listens to the world, crucial. Bonhoeffer was warning us about mixing Christian grace with the world's idea of grace, 
and at worst, substituting the world's idea of grace for Christian grace. For Bonhoeffer, who was writing in the 1930s in the middle of Europe, that influence from the world came from the tragic infatuation of German Christians with Nazism. The precise kind of worldliness may be different now from Nazism then, so I'm not saying that Western culture and the modern church is pro-Nazi. I am saying it is pro-world. Just as in their different way, German Christians tried to be with Nazism. This worldliness is at the heart of Bonhoeffer's criticism. He's echoing the Barman Declaration of 1934 when German confessing Christians, confessing as we are confessing Anglicans, rejected the idea that Christ's people should listen to any other voice claiming to stand on a par with his. The Barman Declaration comes back to that time and time again, the imperative that Christ's people listen to him, the one and only good shepherd, and not to any competing voice, even a voice which says, I'm, I'm simply on a par. It is Christ alone, not Christ and something else whether that and something else is Nazism or liberal Western democracy or even, dare I say it, the legitimate pride in now being an independent country. But what does this cheap grace that conforms to the world actually look like? Bonhoeffer points out two things especially that mark out real grace from cheap grace. First of all, cheap grace is repentanceless. Secondly, this is a grace we bestow on ourselves. In other words, it's a grace we give each other as we see fit rather than actually according to the pattern of God. Now, we need to look at both those aspects, repentancelessness and also bestowing grace on ourselves. To begin with, why does it matter if we have a cheap grace that lacks repentance? First and foremost, it matters because it distorts the gospel. So, Mark chapter 1, verse 14, describes Jesus preaching the gospel. And that's the words in Greek, preaching the gospel. And the content of the gospel that he preaches is repent and believe. Now, at Jerusalem, uh, we global Anglicans rightly emph and emphatically pointed to the Great Commission given to us by the Lord Jesus in Matthew 28. All authority is given to Jesus, proclaiming all he has taught, all nations, and the fourth of those great alls, he will be with us for all time. That commission gives us both the right and the duty to proclaim what Jesus has taught, and we were rightly firm on that. The right, because all authority is his, the duty, because he is the one with all authority, and he has simply told us to. But people can cite even this great commission of Matthew 28 superficially. The key issue is, what is the content of all that Jesus is teaching uh, is, is to be? And here we, pro we compare scripture with scripture, as good Anglicans do, and we read Matthew 28 with Luke 24. Let me refresh your minds about Luke 24, verse 45. Then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. This morning's sermon in the cathedral rightly said that Christ is central. This is how he is central. In his name, there is repentance and forgiveness of sins. So what is the content of what we proclaim to all nations? Luke has made it clear. The content of the Great Commission is the proclamation of repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus and no other name. Peter picks up just that, doesn't he, in Acts chapter 2, in his first great speech. There he is, he's explained that Jesus has been crucified uh, and that it has been done by the very people he's talking to. They ask, what then should we do? And Jesus' response, verse 38 of chapter 2, he tells them to repent and be baptized 
in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. It's the same pattern, isn't it? And so it goes on throughout the Acts of the Apostles. It's climaxes in some ways in Acts 17.30 where Paul says that God now commands all people everywhere to repent because there is a coming judgment. And you can see why repentance really matters. Classically, I repent, don't I, when I recognize my personal sin and I rely on the mercy of Jesus for my forgiveness. I, even I, am forgiven because of his mercy. There's horror at my sin, but more than horror, there's despair at myself and hope solely in Christ for me. Now, of course, we can then see why repentance is so integral to becoming a Christian. I am turning from the flesh, the world, and the devil towards God. That's why, isn't it, our baptismal services have repentance. Now, if there is no repentance, then where am I in, the, in regard to the world? Where am I facing? I'm still facing the same way, aren't I? I haven't turned away from it. I'm trying to love the world and God at the same time. And you can see why cheap grace is such a fear. Because it means you remain facing the world and not facing towards God. Now, we cannot say that the Anglican tradition is any different from that. Think of the Book of Common Prayer services for morning and evening prayer. They begin with extensive prayers of repentance. Think of the 1662 service of the Lord's Supper. The exhortations keep saying we must not approach the Lord's table uh, unrepentantly. We cannot approach it lightly or presumptuously. That means for centuries, repentance has played a vital part both in Anglican worship, uh, service of the word, uh, and in our sacramental services. And this is explained very clearly in the homily on repentance. And we should remember, by the way, that the Jerusalem Declaration and Statement refer us to the 39 articles, which in their turn point us to the books of homilies. Now, that means that we've recognized that the homilies are a live theological resource for our guidance. So what does the homily on repentance say? No doctrine is so necessary in the church of God as the doctrine of repentance and amendment of life. And verily, the true preachers of the gospel, of the kingdom of heaven, and of the glad and joyful tidings of salvation, have always, in their godly sermons and preachings unto the people, joined these two together. I mean repentance and forgiveness of sins, even as our Savior Jesus Christ did appoint himself. And then there follows a reference to, guess where? Luke 24. So, godly preachers in the Anglican tradition, as we would want to be, when they preach the gospel, join repentance and forgiveness of sins together, following Christ. The Anglican reformers weren't out on their own here. Uh, in the reformed tradition uh, on the continent of, uh, of Europe, John Calvin states that with good reason the sum of the gospel is held to consist in repentance and forgiveness of sins. The Lutheran Philip Melanchthon makes exactly the same point in his Apology for the Augsburg Confession, around about 1530. It has always been there. Or it was. Because have you heard church leaders from my country or from North America? And how much honestly have you heard or seen this Luke 24 gospel of repentance and forgiveness of sins? The Great Commission understood that way. Too little, I fear. I think you have heard an awful lot about millennium goals. And you have heard an awful lot about inclusion. But an inclusion without repentance. And therein lies the tragedy. Because if you offer inclusion without repentance, then you are offering inclusion without the forgiveness of sins. And that's desperate. First of all, there is the question of blessing. In Act 3... 25 to 26, Peter refers to the blessings that the Gentiles get under the Abrahamic covenant. He explains what that blessing is, and it's something that's been led up to by the Bible's history for millennia by that point. The blessing 
for the Gentiles is the forgiveness of sins. There again, Paul in Romans 4, verse 7 to 8, quotes the psalmist David, doesn't he? Blessed is he whose sins are forgiven. But in cheap grace, there is no repentance because there will, and there will be no forgiveness because that's thought unnecessary. And the distinctive Christian blessing of forgiveness of sins, well, that drops away to the side, doesn't it? And that profoundly alters our relationship with God. He is no longer the God of the huge, generous mercy, whose nature is always to have mercy, as the prayer book puts it, that he freely gives us as he justifies us by his grace alone through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Remember the parable that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 7. The two debtors, one of whom owes a little, uh, while the other owes a fortune. Jesus teaches that the one who was forgiven much loves much. And the one who was forgiven little loves little. Do you sense in the Western churches this great love of sinners who have been forgiven much by their Heavenly Father? I see admirable concerns for social justice in my own church, as well as genuine good intentions and kindness towards others, and indeed a certain affection towards God. But remember that the parable of Luke 7 is told in the context of a woman who washes Jesus' feet with her hair and dries them. There's an exuberance, there's a passion, there's a sense of her being overwhelmed by the goodness of the Lord Jesus that I think has become alien in a church whose services no longer reflect the priority of repentance and the humble seeking of God's face as we turn away from the world. And the next aspect is something that I say with real trembling. When we read Luke 15, we read three parables that tell us, in fact, about God's joy about the repentant. It is a joy in which we are expected to share. If I'm honest, I think that the way that the Western churches sort of minimized various sins and their consequences means that God would find little to rejoice over in terms of our repentance. We just don't do it. Now, Western churches do repent in some, of some sins, that's perfectly true. The legacy of racism, the history of colonialism, sins of social injustice within their cultures. But what fascinates me is that these are sins that the world recognizes as sins in Western culture. It's very safe in Western culture to say that racism is a sin at the moment. And in many ways, praise God for that. And it's very safe to repent of it. And it even wins a certain admiration from the world. And I'm afraid that where we do repent, we repent of the things that the world finds offensive. And as we know all too painfully, things that the Western world doesn't find offensive, like sexual sins, the Western churches are increasingly disinclined to condemn. Repentance like that, is it really a turning to God? Or actually, is it an acknowledging of the world? Now, this question of repentance is absolutely huge. Biblically, historically, pastorally, in the parable of the lost son, the father speaks of a son who was lost and is now found, who was dead and is now alive. This is fantastic. The Great Commission, properly understood in these Reformation terms of repentance and forgiveness of sins, based on Luke 24, that is the most wonderful news there could be, isn't it? We can take news to people, which means that they can wait confidently, as the Thessalonian Christians did before them, for the return of the Lord Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, the second thing I want to pick up is self-bestowed grace. Self-bestowed grace just assumes that grace will be there and grace will come, because it's inconceivable that God will do otherwise than as we want. Traditionally, this self-bestowing attitude is called presumption, presumption. 
uh, everyday terms, you could call it taking God for granted. The Bible teaches us that presumption is deadly. So in the Old Testament, the kingdom of Judah took it for granted that God would not finally judge them and that they could take him for granted because they had the temple there. In Luke 3, we find people coming before John the Baptist with presumption. And John rebukes them for it, telling them not to presume on the fact that they are physical descendants of Abraham. And again, the problem is taking God for granted. And come to that, in the temptation of our Lord Jesus, Satan tempts Jesus to presumption and Jesus must say no to it. The theological tradition of which global Anglicans are a part and in which the African Augustine played such a huge role has thought long and hard about presumption. Thomas Aquinas puts it like this. Presumption is an inordinate trust in the divine power or mercy consisting in the hope of obtaining glory without merits or pardon without repentance. Such like presumption seems to arise directly from pride, as though man thought so much of himself as to esteem that God would not punish him or exclude him from glory, however much he might be a sinner. Aquinas relates pride to uh, presumption and comments that presumption despises God's justice. We think so highly of ourselves uh, that we cannot imagine God being just, being just towards us and actually punishing us, others possibly, but not us. Note too that Aquinas states repentant, presumption lacks repentance. But why bother to repent when you can presume on a God of cheap grace? The two characteristics, lack of repentance and presumption or self-bestowed grace, they relate intimately, don't they, finally, to pride of human beings who have kind of turned in on themselves rather than looking outwards to their neighbors and towards God. Lack of repentance and presumption are two sides of that same pride coin. Now, as you look at the conduct of the Western church and what it tolerates and what it thinks needs no apology and no repentance, do you not sense presumption, a taking of God for granted? To my shame, I really do. Now, obviously, a Westerner listening in uh, may think that this shows the, the usual obsession with sexual ethics and same-sex relations in particular. But here, we have to remember that the kind of behavior we're talking about, which the Western churches either openly approve or tacitly tolerate, is a symptom of something deeper. Rosaria Champagne Butterfield, an American lady, has written her spiritual biography. It's called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. But she captures something brilliantly in it. She describes the way that the Lord Jesus has brought her out of same-sex relationships and reflects on the way that same-sex behavior is a manifestation, as are other forms of sexual sin, as are our malice and gossip and violence, of our underlying pride and our claim to be owners and disposers of ourselves and our bodies without regard to our creator. For her, pride took this same sex form. For others of us, it will be heterosexual adultery. For others of us, greed. For others of us, power, and so on. But the fundamental disorder is a disordered love of ourselves, which leads to imagine that God cannot possibly judge us presumption. So that is cheap grace. It's not biblical, it's not Anglican, and it desperately shortchanges a world that needs to hear the gospel of repentance and forgiveness of sins. But where's it come from? Let me look first at Western culture and why it is a cheap grace culture. Why has Western culture become so graceless? Now, we can all see that the modern West has little room for God and less time for him. The culture may call itself secular, that could suggest neutrality, but actually there is a real hostility. That's why more and more human rights cases in the UK are coming up that relate to a Christian's freedom of belief. This should amaze us. Western culture is in large part a product of Christian activity, of Christian cultural contributions, as Bishop Michael was saying. That's so 
whether you're talking about the worldview that enabled the scientific revolution or the worldview that enabled a developed doctrine of human rights. Why then so little room for God? Now, I don't think that Western culture started down this path simply by saying, we don't think God matters. It didn't start with God at all. It started in large part with what we think about ourselves, about human beings. The starting point is anthropology not theology. Very, very clear in Immanuel Kant's 1784 essay, What is Enlightenment? Kant says, enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-incurred immaturity. Immaturity is the inability to use one's own understanding without the guidance of another. This immaturity is self-incurred if its cause is not lack of understanding, but lack of resolution and courage to use it without the guidance of another. The motto of enlightenment is, therefore, have courage to use your own understanding. Now, what Kant is getting at is this. The key idea is maturity. Humans have arrived at maturity, and because they're mature, they can do all kinds of things. That's the first thing. They are competent, because a mature person is a competent person, and a mature person needs no external guidance. But there's something else. There's an ethical question, a question of rights. Mature people are entitled to use their own judgment without external interference. So it's both those things. Maturity opens the way for Kant to say, we can. Maturity opens the way for Kant to say, we should be allowed to, and no one should interfere. Mind your own business. Well. On Kant's view, why on earth would you need God to reveal things to you? The Archbishop just now was talking about revelation. Well, not here. You don't need him to tell you his law. For Kant, you can work it out yourself, and that's bound up with the idea that not only can I work it out myself, but by myself I can keep it. I do not need the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ imputed to me because I can do it myself. Now, think how offensive that is to classic Anglican theology, or how offensive Kant would find classic Anglican theology. Take homily one, which is on scripture. Scripture is needed because without it, we can neither sufficiently know God and his will, nor our office and duty. But it's not only our need for revelation that Anglican theology asserts, but our inability to be righteous in and of ourselves. Take this statement from homily two. For of ourselves, we be crab trees that can bring forth no apples. We cannot make our own fruit. Kant's maturity is utterly different, isn't it? After Kant, this maturity is assumed and it's treated as entitlement. It is not something you have to earn. Now, that takes us to something that I think is absolutely vital in current Western culture, our sense of entitlement. I think we can see this in two areas. The first is our emphasis on rights. The second is the growth of, socially speaking, narcissism, by which I mean the whole idea of having far too high an idea of yourself, and I'll explain it a bit more later. But first of all, the growth of rights. Europe and North America have become very much rights cultures. For us in Europe, it's the European Convention on Human Rights, especially the rights that flow out of equality, again, as Bishop Michael uh, was pointing out. Please note several features about this. First, inevitably individualism. We all wonder why the modern West is so individualist, but of course it's individualist. It has a doctrine of rights that the individual holds, and that's as far down as you, go, as you can possibly go, because the basic building block for society is the individual, not the family, because it's the individual who has the rights. What's more, those rights are just there. You don't have to earn them, they're just there for you. You don't have to qualify for them, you just have them, you're born to them. Second, this individualism is incoherent. There's strangely little discussion, and Bishop Michael was majoring on this rightly, of why you have these rights and where they come from. 
The history of these ideas in Europe is that people are thought of as having rights because they are God's creatures, they're God's gift. So Americans put it in terms of, uh, we believe that uh, uh, men and women are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. But in modern Europe, you cannot assert that God is the creator in the public arena. So there's a problem. Roman Catholic uh, thinker Marcelo Pera points out that this means that the modern West is busy trying to forget where it actually came from. It's an amnesiac culture trying to live down its Christian past. How, how can you, though, have a strong sense of identity of who you are when you don't acknowledge your history? The modern West wants all the benefits of a society with individual rights, but doesn't want the basis on which they were actually formed. It's like climbing a tree, going out on a branch, sitting on it, and then chopping off the branch that you're sitting on. This is not a recipe for success. It's the same kind of problem that atheist uh, uh, German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche saw right back in the 19th century. He posed the question of whether Europe could keep its morality without its God. And he mocked the English especially for thinking that this was possible. As someone brought up in England, I reckon Nietzsche was spot on, as is Marcelo Pera. Because if, as the modern West says, you can't talk about God giving us those rights, where do they come from? People don't want to say that the rights are actually given by society, because if you do that, then presumably society could take them away. And sooner or later, the individual becomes king or queen. There are lots of individuals in Europe. And that means lots of kings and lots of queens, or people who think they are. Now, don't underestimate the problems this creates. You've got this robust doctrine of rights. But can you really build a society on rights, the rights of the individual? What happens when those rights conflict with one another? And I think that's what some of you in the global south observe about us, that our individualism breeds various conflicts and in particular an individualism where the individual prefers himself or herself to the good of others. These problems were seen long ago. There's a long prehistory of analyzing them. Again, it's another Catholic thinker, this time Giuseppe Mazzini, uh, in the 19th century in Italy. Mazzini argued that it is not enough to speak of rights. We must speak of duties too. In fact, he said, when we look at Christ, we must look first for duty, because that's where Jesus leads us. Think of his summary of the law. He doesn't say, I have the right to have uh, my neighbor love me. He says, duty, love your neighbor. So Mazzini says this, the origin of your duties is in God. The definition of your duties is found in his law. The progressive discovering of the application of his law is the task of humanity. But you can see the problem for the West, can't you? It's all very well to talk of rights, but where do duties come from? Why do we Westerners have all these declarations of rights and no declarations of duties? What do you sense about this in the West? Do you sense that we have as robust a sense of duty as we do of our rights? But this rights theory is enormously attractive. Whether you like it or not, we've managed to evolve a system uh, where there are fundamental human rights and we talk about them a lot and we have very little to say about human duties and we may feel that this is incoherent, but my goodness, it's attractive. And that is what the modern West is holding out, culturally speaking. Tempting, isn't it? And this is not only attractive, it's plausible. It's plausible not least because of the technological achievements of the West. When I look at my computer or use my phone, I'm deeply impressed by what human minds have done. Now, remember that Kant used the word maturity to imply competence and ability. Doesn't this tempt you to think that Kant is right? Surely we are as competent and as able as he said. And if I may say so, frankly, I'm not sure that you in the Global South 
have fully taken this on board. Kant's value system is going to look very plausible for your cultures as well as very attractive. Not only is this attractive and plausible, this culture is now enormously powerful. The assumption of maturity, the sense of entitlement that goes with it, create values that even now are being pumped around the world through technological achievement. You cannot keep it out by border posts or immigration control. People will read this stuff, they will be impressed by it, because we just say it so much as part of our presuppositions in the West. And it will become the air that you breathe too. Sometimes, of course, the West is much more overt, actually, in imposing its values. So as a UK citizen, I am still deeply ashamed of the way a few years back that the UK Prime Minister, David Cameron, tied foreign aid to pro-same-sex policies in a speech he made. Western culture says a lot, it shouts a lot, and it spends a lot. Do not underestimate its power to reshape your cultures too in its own interests. And remember, it will want to do so because it thinks it's righteous. For sure, you, you must have sensed that too, haven't you? The Western cultural sense of self-righteousness about individual rights and liberal democracy, and so on, and so on. So that's the first thing to say about our sense of entitlement, the way it creates and is also supported by this doctrine of individualist rights without duties. Let me take you now to the social phenomenon of narcissism. And I'm using this especially because of recent work by a couple of American social psychologists uh, called Jean Twangy and Keith Campbell. They have a simple starting point, this whole idea of thinking too highly of ourselves. They conducted a prolonged survey of surveys done on American students entering college. The surveys are a standard nationwide, and amongst other things, they test for narcissism. Twanky and Campbell put it like this. The central feature of narcissism is a very positive and inflated view of the self. People with high levels of narcissism, whom we refer to as narcissists, think they are better than others in social status, good looks, intelligence and creativity. Narcissists see themselves as fundamentally superior. They are special, entitled, and unique. Narcissists also lack emotionally warm, caring, and loving relationships with others. The result is a fundamentally imbalanced self, a grandiose, inflated self-image, and a lack of deep connection with others. Now, Twangy and Campbell aren't saying this fits everybody. They are saying, though, that it fits more and more people, and more and more people are changing to fit it, and they're saying that the attitudes that underlie it are more and more tolerable. For Twangy, this is painfully evidenced by the way that uh, self-respect has, uh, has been morphed uh, into self-esteem, and she sees it encapsulated in the chorus of an old Whitney Houston song, which says, learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. It almost stops you in your tracks, doesn't it? The greatest love of all is loving yourself. And some schools now adopt the strategy of increasing self-esteem with young children by teaching them precisely that and by playing that song. My colleague Mel Lacey, who specializes in youth and children's work, read this talk and her comment on this paragraph is simply this. It's basically what our education system is now about. Self-love. And the key word here is entitlement. And this entitlement is not, it's not a question of what we do. So it's not the old Pelagian heresy that says you've got to acquire merit by works. It's actually something you just have. It comes with the package. Secondly, Twangy and Campbell point to the disappointments that this all causes. Of course it disappoints. Not everybody can be a pop star, and not every essay gets an A. Ask my students. And the person with the entitlement attitude is ill-equipped to cope. Twangy and Campbell discuss how prone disappointed narcissists are to anger and rage. Of course, disappointment can make any of us angry, but Twangy and Campbell note how extreme it becomes. For me, it's very interesting to read what Twangy and Campbell say about entitlement and the rage that follows frustration after what happened in my own country last year. 
in November when the majority uh, are arguing in favor of a particular kind of pro-women bishops legislation found that it could not get its way. And the only word that can describe the reaction is rage. It's even more pertinent to look at the reactions of presiding Bishop Jefford Shorey to churches that frustrate her. Rage and extreme action. It fits like a glove, doesn't it? This explains why certain kinds of dissent are deeply problematic now in Western culture. If you challenge entitlement, the perception is that you have attacked rights and are attacking people's self-esteem, and that's perceived as being great moral flaws. That's why the modern West in its culture will only hear a word of cheap grace. Because cheap grace fits with entitlement, it doesn't demand repentance, and it can be bestowed by ourselves. And the real grace, linked with repentance and forgiveness of sins, that now challenges Western culture at a very deep level, well, it's no surprise that when you read the Western media, how frequently the comments actually reflect rage. The summary phrases are, how dare you say that? Or, very interesting, you have no right to say that. But where's the Western church in all this? Why has the Western church been prone to promoting cheap grace? First of all, please remember how puzzling the situation is for Western churches and their leaders. Think of it. So much of the leadership of major denominations, including the Church of England, has made a virtue of trying to modernize itself. That's the language used, isn't it? Modernize. And the project is to bring the, world, the, the church into line with the world around it. And the theory was that if the church did this, people in the secular West would flock back to church in droves. That hasn't happened. But if you commit yourself to a program of modernization, then it is baffling to find that the modern world still doesn't want you. But it will be enormously emotionally costly to try to think through why you've given up too much. And it seems almost impossible for past and present uh, Church of England leaders to ask whether their modernization is part of the problem. They will ask you in the Global South to modernize. Don't fall for it. It is a recipe for disaster. Just look at us. Secondly, you may be thinking that I'm being too hard. So let me describe a recent service of evening prayer at a conference of relatively senior levels at a diocesan level. Those leading the service had a presentation which spoke of three calls. The first call was to love God. The second call was to love your neighbor. The third call was to be yourself. Does anything strike you about that? What strikes me is that self is right up there with love of God and love of neighbor. And this was not given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, but is something that we have made up and put on a level up there with the other two. These three calls were then explained. Most time was spent on the third call, and that call to be yourself was explained in terms of identifying your desires and then following them. It looks remarkably like the sense of entitlement and self-first that Twangy and Campbell discern in the entitlement culture, doesn't it? It is a spiritualization of narcissism. Thirdly, let us try to see something of the roots. Remember I said that Kant's enlightenment thinking didn't start by talking about God. It started by talking about ourselves, about humanity. This is, I think, what's happened in the Church of England. Let me take you back over 100 years to the publication of the hugely influential Lux Mundi essays of 1889. Several essays shared the key point that when John 1, 9, I'd be grateful if you could turn to it in your Bibles now, that when John 1, 9 speaks of the true light enlightening all, it means that even before the incarnation of the Lord Jesus, we already had divine light and reason within us. We have that divine light and reason, and so, because it's within us, we can tell what's right and wrong from within. 
But of course, that means we're talking about us. Crucially, John definitely doesn't mean that. If we had the divine light of reason within us, already illuminating us so that we could tell right from wrong, as the essayists thought, then the world would not have rejected the true light, would it, when he did come into the world? Look at verses, nine and t uh, verses 10 and 11. This is exactly the point that John makes, isn't it? That the world was made through him, that he had his own people, and Christ was still rejected. John's references to light are best taken as references to the light of life, the creative activity of the eternal world, word, which John has in view in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1. That's what it's about. Thirdly, if the divine light is already at work illuminating my reason, giving this knowledge of right and wrong so that I don't need anything else, and this applies to the whole human race, then what of the world? Well, the logic is we should listen to it, isn't it? We should listen to it. It implies that the world should set the agenda because the world already has the eternal light within it. I fear that this is what much of the current Church of England sounds like to me. Let the world set the agenda. And this means uh, that, that as one listens to, to a Western church leader, it's vital to ask a, a couple of questions. The question is not, do they mention Christ's agenda? The question is whether the Christ whose agenda is talked about is the Christ attested by the scriptures or the Christ that I have carefully put within me and who, curiously enough, always agrees with me. And there is also the question, you talk about Christ's agenda, but to what extent should the world also set the agenda? And as you go through John's Gospel, you can see, can't you, that John doesn't mean what the Lux Mundi essayist said. In John 7:7, 7, 7, Jesus himself tells us that the world hates him. It hates because he testifies against it that its deeds are evil. Now, that's impossibly wrong of the Lord Jesus on the Lux Mundi view, isn't it? Lux Mundi, Jesus Christ. That's not the hardest question as to which to prefer, is it? If you're following these essayists, then Jesus would be quite wrong to see the sharp distinction, the sharp opposition that he does from the world towards him. Now, I've shown briefly that this exegesis of John 1.9 is desperately wrong. But please understand that this theology has been running round, and indeed running, the Church of England for decades. And it opens the door to cheap grace. Because it says, yes, not just to Jesus, but also to the world. It's not, please note an explicit no to Jesus, but it is a Jesus and the world approach. As you look at us in the Church of England, I'm afraid you are looking at a church which has an increasingly worldly view of grace. A cheap grace in which repentance is increasingly redundant. And which we can safely bestow on ourselves because we already have divine light within us, so we know when God's going to be gracious to us, and frighteningly, God never disagrees with us. Because his voice comes from within. As I look at what's happening to the church in which I was ordained, I'm very struck by the way that what Twangy and Campbell say about narcissism and entitlement applies. They, they analyze the almost religious feel of Western narcissism like this. The quest for self is in some ways the misguided quest for the divine spark within. That could come straight from Lux Mundi. Now we've teased out why cheap grace with its worldliness is inevitably going to be there in Western culture and in one of the most dominant forms of the Western church. Joining Jesus with the world so that we say Jesus and the world, well, that's always going to be popular as a way of appeasing the world. And the Western world right now does issue challenges to the church to modernize, by which it means catch up with us, catch up with worldly opinion. But while the world may want cheap grace, it is not what the world needs. To cheap grace, Bonhoeffer opposed costly grace, a costly grace which costs everything in that it is grace that we receive repentantly and with humility, not presumption. That is the grace associated with the forgiveness of sins and peace with God. The world's needs are many, we all know that. But this is its greatest need, that its sins be forgiven. 
And that is why it is absolutely imperative that we global Anglicans preach not cheap grace, but costly grace to the world. Not because we hate the world, but because we love it, as our Saviour did.